Hi there. You're listening to the Hellenistic Age Podcast. Interview episode, Greco-Buddhism in Central Asia and India, with Lee Clark. Hello, everyone. Joining us on the show today is Lee Clark, a PhD student specializing in the philosophy of religion and cross-cultural philosophy at Nottingham Trent University. His current thesis is centered on the similarities and differences shared by Greek and Buddhist philosophy. And today, he is here to discuss his work and the development of Buddhist thought. First off, I'd like to just say thank you so much for taking the time to come on the podcast. No problem. I'm glad to have an opportunity to do this and increase awareness. So no, no problem at all. I'm glad you have me on here. Thank you for having me. Would you care to talk about your background and how you began to study the history and philosophy of Buddhism? Yeah, sure. So firstly, India, I guess, has always been present in my life because my grandfather, my, my mom's dad, was Anglo-Indian. And for North American viewers and even well, European viewers, you might not be fully aware of the term. It basically was a mixed race person of Indian and European ancestry during the British Raj when the British ruled India. Essentially, what basically happened was when the British first got to India, there wasn't a lot of British women that went with the East India Company, etc. So, of course, they had to marry, obviously, you'd hope they would have fell in love first, but they had to marry Indian women. So my granddad wasn't full half and half. His mother, I think, was half and half herself. So my granddad was, I think, a quarter Indian himself. That is kind of why I'm so interested in the Hellenistic age generally, especially the Indo-Greeks, because I kind of view the Indo-Greeks as a predecessor of Anglo-Indians, as in the sense of Westerners in the East mixed between both cultures, if that makes sense. So that's why I'm kind of so interested in this Hellenistic age in particular. Buddhism, I always knew about it. In a sense, everyone knows, oh yeah, there are these people called Buddhist monks and they walk around and bicker arms and you know, you have a general idea. When I started studying philosophy in, in university in, in the UK, I began to read Indian philosophy. And the first couple I read were Hindu texts translated by a guy called Eknath S. Warren. And I'm pretty sure he is the most popular translator of these texts in the US as well. And he translated the Bhagavad Gita, which is the text about Krishna and Arjuna from the Mahabharata, kind of epic in Indian literature. And he translated the Upanishad, which are kind of like Indian philosophical texts, which I'll come on to a bit later, and also the Dharmapada. And essentially, it's a collection of literally just quotes from the Buddha, without context or anything. It's just quotes from different sutras from the Pali Karna of the Buddha. And I'm actually, um, at the time of of speaking, I'm doing my third thesis chapter, and it's a comparison of Marcus Aurelius's meditations and this text of Dharmapada. And basically what I think it was made for is because the Buddhist canon, for those who know about it, is so big. And I think that for um, monks and even lay people walking around India, Central Asia, etc., it would have been really impractical for them to carry around these great big bags of ancient texts, you know. So they needed a kind of practical handbook so they could remind themselves of the Buddhist teachings. And I think this is what the Dharmapada solved this problem of that. So I began to read the Dharmapada, and, and I really kind of liked it. And uh, at the time... As many people would obviously have gone through a similar, I was going through a bit of bad mental health, etc. And one of the lines in the Dharmapada, you become what you think. And basically he says that you can control your own mind. And it kind of really spoke to me at that point because I think I was letting my mind control me. And it really helped me get out of that bad kind of stage I was going through. And it really helped me. So because of that, I guess I was interested in Indian philosophy anyway, like I said. But I began to study Buddhist philosophy in depth and I realised that I really did agree with it brought me to where I am today. So yeah, so that is really a kind of short version of my story, how I come to, to study it. Today, Buddhism is well known as one of the great religions of world history, accompanying those like Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, and Judaism, to name a few. But initially, it was an ascetic movement founded by Siddhartha Gautama. Can you provide a brief account of the beginnings of Buddhism and give us an idea as to how it differed from contemporary religious or even philosophical outlooks? I think one idea that I've mentioned a lot in my thesis, and I guess that some people still have a kind of misconception about, is the real separation between philosophy and religion. I think we need to speak about that first. Nowadays, especially in in the West, in modern university departments, etc., you will have a religious studies department and a philosophy department. But the idea that they're completely separate fields is a kind of recent one, in my opinion, and this is just my 
personal opinion. It only really originated during the Enlightenment. And I think that the idea that they're completely separate things with a kind of wall between them is a relatively recent innovation. I think in the East, that kind of wall isn't there. I think that the two domains are kind of more mixed in the East. I think we need to remember that, for want of a better word, in the Eastern context, the two domains are all meshed together. Basically, I will give the traditional story of Buddhism. Now, whether it's historically accurate, it's difficult to tell, but this is the story that has been passed down, etc. Traditionally, it says that he was a prince, and that he was born in the border region between what's now modern Nepal and India. Modern scholarship doesn't really agree on it. He was a prince. It says that he was a kind of son of a independent little republic state on the, the border. He was the son of the chief of one of these republics. So he was still obviously from a privileged background. He wouldn't have been a prince. And I obviously kind of agree with that. I don't really think it matters if he was a prince or not. But the point is, he was from a privileged background and it would have had a lot, like a better life than a lot of the other people living in his time and, and region. The story says that the priest came to predict the Buddhist future when he was born and said that he would either be a or a great ruler, essentially, or a great religious figure. So, of course, his dad was like, no, nah, I want him to be the ruler of all India. That, that sounds like quite a better deal. And at the time, there were a lot of religious ascetics, etc., Samanas, we'll come, come on to later, wandering around. So to prevent him seeing these people and getting the kind of inspiration to be one himself and become a religious figure, he kind of shielded him from the outside world. Eventually, you know, Shinra from gave him everything that a young man could desire, the best food, the best clothes, he was married. And basically one day the story says that eventually he got kind of curious and went out on a chariot ride with his servant and that he saw a dead man, a sick man and an old man. And he was kind of worried and he said to his chariot, you know, what, what are, what's wrong with these people? Because obviously the story says he'd never seen anyone suffer before. So he was like, you know, what are these people? And they said, you know, well, these people. These people are old and dead and sick. You know, it happens for everyone. It's going to happen to you one day. And the Buddha was obviously like terrified and there's a massive like existential crisis because he'd never imagined this before. Eventually, the story says that he becomes so distressed and upset by this revelation that it was that life wasn't perfect that he decided to go on a quest to find the answer to why we suffer in general. He left his wife and young son because he was that determined and he went and became a ascetic in the forest for a number of years. Now, a lot of ascetics will come on to kind of later, but they did numerous things. A lot of them deprived themselves of all worldly comforts. They slept and ate in the rain and everything. They barely ate any food, all different things like that. And the Buddha was one of these ascetics. Now, eventually he did this for a number of years and realized that it wasn't helping him achieve his goal to find the end of suffering. So he adopted what, what he called the middle way. So being a rich prince or son of a clan chief didn't help. Being someone down the other end of the scale with nothing didn't help. So you had to adopt a path that went in the middle of those two extremes. Essentially, the Buddhist, with this new thought in mind, went and sat down by the Bodhi tree, the famous Bodhi tree currently in India and still, or rather the descendant of it, and said, I'm not leaving this spot until I achieve my goal. And the story says that obviously he did achieve his goal, he saw his past lives, etc. And he achieved his goal and became the Buddha. And the Buddha, people might know, it wasn't actually his name, it was his title. Buddha means awakened one, so he'd become known as the awakened one. Some other outlooks that were around at the time, there were people called the um, Ajivikas, which were people who believed that everything was determined by fate, so there was no reason to kind of do anything. There were the Lokayatas or Charavakas, they're also known as, which were basically kind of atheists, we would say, in our modern Western terminology. They were materialists, they didn't believe in karma or the soul or rebirth, etc. And they just basically hedonists, they believed in, in pleasure, get, get it what you can. So there were numerous outlooks going around India at this time. And I think the Buddha obviously did share elements of all of these traditions, as in like they were from the same culture, etc. But I think what made Buddhism unique is its focus on suffering. What the idea of that is, is that the word in Pali to mean suffering in, in translated to English is dukkha. And the word is commonly misunderstood because what the word actually kind of translates to better is less suffering than dissatisfactoriness, that you're dissatisfied with life. And when the Buddha became enlightened, he formulated the famous the Four Noble Truths, which I'm sure a lot of listeners would have heard of. So the first noble truth was that life is dukkha, is permeated by dukkha. And that's normally translated as life is suffering. 
And that can give a kind of depressing view of what Buddhism kind of teaches. So to correct that view, it does mean suffering. And suffering to me means kind of intense, you know, emotional or physical kind of pain or anguish. But the word can also mean, like I said, dissatisfactoriness. So that can be anything from being bored, stubbing your toe, anything that, that's annoying, that is what permeates life. And I think that's a lot more relatable than saying life is suffering. Because everybody gets bored or annoyed or even upset or down at some point. The second was that the reason for this suffering. And that was the idea that suffering is the cause of suffering, and it's caused by craving. And the word in Pali is tanha, which means thirst. Basically the idea that we crave for things to be a certain way, and they're not. And that's what causes us to suffer. And that, again, that can be anything. So you crave to get a better grade on your test, and you've got a bad one. That's dukkha, what's causing you to suffer. The third noble truth is just literally the fact that we can solve this problem by disassociating ourselves from craving and attachment. And the fourth noble truth is the way to do this, which is the Noble Eightfold Path, a kind of path of practical ethics, how to act, etc., set out by the Buddha. So that is basically the basic Buddhist beliefs, the, the goal of Buddhism to end suffering. So that is literally the basic belief of Buddhism. Like other important religious figures, it is difficult to try and get an accurate assessment of the Buddha's life and his teachings given the remoteness of the period from our own. What sort of information do we have, written histories, religious texts, inscriptions, that scholars can use to try and reconstruct the earliest history of Buddhist thought? That is a big problem because a lot of famous religious slash spiritual philosophical figures did not write anything down. It's the same with Confucius, with Jesus, of course, and with Socrates and many other figures. And all of their teachings that we know about were transmitted by their disciples. The Buddha is no different. The Pali Canon, which is not the oldest, but one the kind of most complete collection of sutras that we have, was written centuries after the Buddha died. So, of course, it's not going to be entirely historically accurate, but... As far as I know, scholars have determined that all of these teachings contained in the Pali Suttas basically are consistent enough to have come from a single person. There is no Buddha myth theory. So the main thing we have to go on is, is texts. Events were going on before the scriptures were finalised. There were meetings from the monks and everything. Kind of like the meetings that took place in Christian history about doctrine. Not really so much in doctrine, but kind of to help preserve the Buddha's teachings. So that was all going on anyway. Apart from texts, we have archaeology, so we have stupas, which are rounded structures that are supposed to bear relics of the Buddha or other important texts and things like that. They have survived a great deal because they're a bit out of stone, obviously, it's quite survivable material. And they spread over a wide area, so we can obviously tell if, there's, if there are a lot of stupas in an area or stupas there, we can tell that Buddhist monks and Buddhist teachings, by extension, have spread to this area. Mainly archaeology, there are inscriptions and stuff as well. Obviously, there is the Indian king Ashoka, the third king of the Mauryan Empire, and he conquered a lot more of the Indian subcontinent, was about to conquer a kingdom in the south of India called Kalinga, conquered it and won the battle, but saw the destruction he'd caused, the lives he'd killed, essentially, and had a kind of spiritual crisis, and he converted to Buddhism. As a result of this, he adopted Buddhism and he spread Buddhism for him. We'll come on to this later. But the main important thing, which is why so well known, is the fact that he do write inscriptions across the Mauryan Empire saying about Buddhist teachings, his ethical teachings, etc. And we know that these teachings of Buddhists have been traced back. So that's also a big thing. And there are numerous other statues, loads of different things, again, we'll come on to later, that we can use to construct the early history of Buddhism. So the main things we have to summarise the history of Buddhist thought would be archaeological evidence, we have texts, and we have inscriptions. In antiquity, the region of Gandhara, approximately northwestern Pakistan and parts of East Afghanistan, is viewed as an epicenter of Buddhism and a vehicle by which it was transmitted throughout much of Central and East Asia. Why was Buddhism able to establish such a stronghold in this region, and how was it carried into places like China or the rest of Afghanistan and beyond? Well, yeah, so Gandhara was a very, very important region for the spread of Buddhism. 
it's so important because it lied on what we call the Silk Roads. And the Silk Roads were basically trade routes, essentially, that stretched from in Europe and Italy and stretched all the way to China, all through Central Asia and India. So they were very, very important trade routes all across Eurasia, and we call them the Silk Roads. They also were a very, very big way of spreading ideas and religions. And Gandhara was in a very good position on the Silk Roads loads of traders and people of different religions because they weren't just Buddhists on these roads. There were Christians and Zoroastrians and Manicheans and just all spread around and traders, etc. from all over Eurasia. Buddhist monasteries acted as sanctuaries for traders. Because of the way Buddhism was kind of structured with the Sangha, which is the community of, of monks, it was quite city orientated because obviously they needed cities to build monasteries and cities were also big hubs for trade. Buddhism was quite good for traders as well, especially in, from Indian traders, because of concurrent Brahmin beliefs, you had to do sacrifices in physical locations. Buddhism, you could kind of carry anywhere. You could, you could be Buddhist anywhere. So it was, good for, it was good for traders. So because monks moved all along these trade routes, Buddhism spread a lot. And as I said, the same happened for Christianity and other religions too. Gandhara was in a very good position. And monks had to go through Gantara to reach China. There would have been monks passing through this area the whole time. And because it, as, as we'll talk about later, was a kind of Greek area, there was a massive cross-cultural diffusion here. So essentially, it was just in a very good position at the exact right time. Um, to get to India or China, Chinese and Indian monks, and it was obviously Central Asian monks, would have had to pass through this area all of the time. So it was just in a very good position. From Gandhara, we have very important developments in the history of Buddhism. There were translators, for one, who moved mainly to China and Central Asia from Gandhara. So there were Lokaksema, Prajna, Dhanapala, who were translators who went on to China to translate Sanskrit Buddhist texts into Chinese. Pilgrims as well. Pilgrimage is a lot, sometimes associated a lot more with, with Christianity. Obviously, we might never medieval Europe. People will go all over Europe to visit the relics of saints, etc. Buddhism had a similar culture to Christianity in this regard. When it spread to China, it kind of meshed and also went against Chinese culture because it meshed with Taoism or Taoism, as it might be known, to the extent that because obviously Sanskrit is a very different language from Chinese, the Chinese had to use Taoist and Taoist terminology and words to translate Buddhist texts and Buddhist terms. But it did go against Confucians, and the Confucians have never really liked Buddhism at all, because of course Confucianism, for those who know about it, emphasises societal and family ties, you should do things for your society and your, your family. Buddhism, of course, advocates moving away from your family and joining a monastery if you're a monk. So Confucians never really liked the Buddhists very much. There's always been a kind of rivalry between Buddhism and Confucianism that continued throughout this period and obviously far beyond as well. So to sum up again, it was essentially because Gandhra was in a great position for trade, traders, members of different religions and sects passed through all the time. It was great for the spread of ideas and monks often followed in the wake of traders and Buddhists would have wanted to convert. And so it would have been good for that as well. So yeah, essentially trade, pilgrimage and things like that made Gandhra a very good place for the explosion of, um, of Buddhist thought generally. As is the case with most religions, there are various sects under the general umbrella of Buddhist thought. With reference to Gandhara, did a particular school or belief structure emerge that differed when compared to its predecessors? And if so, what were some of its most important contributions to the development of how Buddhism was spread and practiced? There are a lot of schools that originated in Gandhara. Too many of me to kind of go into here because obviously I don't want to bore the listeners completely. You know, there are a lot of schools that originated in Gandhara that spread to China and through China to Korean Peninsula and Japan, of course, as well. Basically, Gandhara was a massive influence on Asian thought in general, East Asian thought in particular. A lot of schools went from Gandhara to other places in East Asia. The other influence was in general Mahayana Buddhist thought. Now, there are two main sects in Buddhism today. There is Theravada and Mahayana. And some Western viewers might have a misconception about this because obviously they might think that they are equivalent to Protestant and Catholic in Christianity or Sunni and Shia in Islam. They're not really, because obviously you think, right, you've got two main schools, they must be against each other. It's not really like that in, in Buddhism. From the work of a very, very good British Buddhist scholar called Paul Williams, 
So Mahayana wasn't really a set of beliefs as such. It was more a vision of Buddhism or a motivation that wasn't based on doctrinal differences. So the main differences in Buddhism that counted were based on differences in the monastic rule. So, of course, to live as a monk, you have to live by a certain set of rules. These were widely reinterpreted, misinterpreted, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, throughout where Buddhism spread. There would only really be a kind of schism, if that's the right word, in Buddhism, if monastic rules were different. So that was the main thing that mattered. And Williams uses the word difference in Buddhism is focused on orthopraxy rather than orthodoxy. So in, in Christianity, um, the main differences were based on belief. Obviously, Catholics and Protestants have very different beliefs about Jesus and other main Christian beliefs, the same with Sunni and Shia Islam. Buddhism isn't. Buddhism is based on kind of practical differences. There would have been obviously differences in beliefs that sprung up when there were different monastic rules, etc. But it's mainly based on different practical differences in the monastic rule and the way it's practiced. So you could have had Theravada and Mahayana monks in the same monastery. And as far as, as Chinese and Buddhist report, that did actually happen a lot in India. And no one really cared. It wasn't like a kind of reformation that you have like, you know, like a Buddhist Martin Luther nailing a 95 thesis to the monastery door. You know, you could have had loads of different monks reporting loads of different things and believing in loads of different ways. And other monks might have thought, yeah, you know, they're a bit weird, but they wouldn't have thought, you know, they're heretics or anything that need to be like taught the right way to do things. What that vision of the Buddhist path entailed was that the Mahayana thought that the solitary pursuit of enlightenment was too individualistic. What they wanted to do was they didn't seek just nirvana. They saw what they call perfect Buddhahood, which would be enlightenment for everybody in the world. All beings, not just human, all beings in the world. They had a real desire out of compassion and kindness to help all beings in the world escape suffering. And that is why they named their path the Mahayana, which means greater vehicle, as opposed to the Hinayana, which they kind of derogatorily called Theravada monks, which is the, the lesser vehicle. Williams thinks that could have arisen from monks that took to the forest and left the monastery and kind of had a desire to go back to what they saw as the original Buddhism. You could compare that to the Reformation a little bit in the sense that uh, Martin Luther, of course, in Europe wanted to go back to what he saw as the original Christianity that had been corrupted by the Catholic Church. But it wasn't, it really wasn't so drastic. There wasn't massacres and, and fights like there was in the Reformation, which caused a lot of, of, of bloodshed in Europe. And there was also spiritual exercise that Buddhist monks did, uh, known as um, Buddha Nu Smriti, which basically was a meditation where you would meditate that you were in the presence of the Buddha. You would meditate on the kind of figure and person of the Buddha and imagine that he was there with you. Paul Williams says a really interesting kind of thing that he thinks this might have caused, I guess, kind of spiritual visions in a way that they, you know, they might have believed that they might have been lost in meditation, believed the Buddha was really talking to them. And that created a kind of sense of continuing revelation that the Buddha was, a, that was still here in a way. He was still saying, continuing what he taught. And the Mahayanists uh, created scriptures that they said were the true Buddhist scriptures. The Theravadists, too many relied on the Pali Canon, kind of rejected this, said that no, they're not really canon, uh, meaning that in both the modern sense of the term and, that, and the old sense of the term. But the Mahayanists, they kind of solved the issue by saying, you know, if it sounds like the Buddha, then we can say it's the word of the Buddha or Buddha Vakana, as they call it. Mahayana developed in, in India and all across kind of Central Asia, but it did have a big start in Gandhara. One of the main schools that developed in Gandhara was called um, Yogacara, and it was developed by two Gandh native Gandharan monks. Um, there were brothers actually, half of this called Asanga and Vasubandhu, and they, they were, were Gandharan, and they created a, a Mahayana school called Yogacara. And Yogacara is very cool philosophically to read about because they essentially thought that everything was mental. And there was no physical reality. Everything was mental and created by mind. And they come up with all, that's the essential belief of the school. They believe everything was mental and created by the mind. And they come up with all sorts of complex philosophical arguments to justify this belief. But they were a very influential school, a very interesting school, because they turned everything we commonly believe on its head. And that developed in Gantara um, by Gantaran monks. As well as all the other schools, Gandhara wasn't the only place the Mahayana developed, it was one of the most important, and it had a big hand in the development of Mahayana and Buddhist thought. There are also the Gandhari scriptures, which I will briefly mention. I'm not an expert in those, but they are scriptures found written in Gandhari, which were known as the oldest scriptures of Buddhism that we actually have, older than the Pali Khanan even. And in the kind of whole area of Gandhara, in the, the Afghan, but especially, have the Buddhas of 
Bamiyan, which were the big statues of Buddha that were unfortunately destroyed by the Taliban in uh, 2001. We will come on to art, obviously, later, but that was also a development. So, yeah, Gandhra did contribute a lot to Mahayana Buddhism and to other schools and doctrine generally. With the invasion of Alexander the Great and the Macedonian army in the Punjab in 327, the Greek and Indian worlds were brought into close contact for the first time, in turn exposing each other to the traditions of Buddhism and Hellenism respectively. Similarities between Hellenistic and Buddhist thought have been noted in philosophical movements like Pyrrhonian skepticism and Stoicism, but could you elaborate on these parallels further? It was a very big moment when Alexander entered into the Punjab because obviously the you know, long-time listeners of the series will know this already but Alexander conquered an empire stretched from Macedonia and Greece to India that is a very 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 big area of land that he conquered and obviously because of that it resulted in a lot of cross-cultural transmission Alexander founded cities in the area he conquered most of them then after himself he obviously had, had a bigger uh, ego there he did found Greek cities in India that were staffed by Greek and Macedonian soldiers who would have brought their families and that would have encouraged more people to go, and etc, etc. That's how settlements are built. So he did have land in India and he did bring Greek and Indian culture together. Because of this, there were big, as I said, cross-cultural developments. Alexander actually had with him three philosophers that kind of went with him to categorise Indian philosophy, Indian thought, the same as a botanist or biologist would go and classify different species. The Greeks were obviously incredibly curious about other cultures and traditions. They wanted to find out stuff. And Alexander, it should be noted, was taught by Aristotle. So obviously he had a very, very good education in philosophy, and he might have been interested himself in philosophy. Stoicism, I'll start on that first, because I don't think there is any real evidence for direct influence on Stoicism from Indian philosophy or vice versa. I think that Stoicism and Buddhism sought similar things. For example, Stoicism says that we suffer because we care about things that are beyond our control, caring about what's in our control to change, and living in accordance with nature, and fate, what universal nature has put in store for us, etc. It says that we care about too much about things that are beyond our control, like politics, riches, fame, because we're slaves to our impressions and our opinions about things. So Stoicism also had an idea of why we suffer and how to beat it. I think this was independent. I don't think there's any evidence for mainstream influence of this. I think it's very similar. There are big differences between Buddhism and Stoicism, but they arose independently, I think. With Pyro, I, I never know if I pronounce his name correctly. I'm going to say Pyro, Fira, you know, I, I'll, you know who I mean. <laughs> That's a lot more interesting because a lot of scholars, one of the best recent ones is, I have the book actually on my desk in front of me, is by Christopher Beckwith. And he gives a good argument that Fira was directly influenced by Buddhism. I kind of agree with him. And there are other scholars. One of them is called Thomas Machiavelli. He wrote a brilliant book, and I really do recommend this to everybody who's interested in this, called The Shape of Ancient Thought. And he basically argues that Indian philosophy influenced Greek philosophy and vice versa. Way before Alexander, when parts of India and parts of Greece were, were um, part of the Persian Empire, the Indian and Greek scholars met and influenced each other that way in things like monism and different ideas. When Alexander conquered the Punjab, it happened in the other direction. It's a brilliant but It's very long, but it's really good. He disagrees, actually with the idea that Poirot was influenced by Buddhism. Poirot, for those who don't know, was called a sceptic. He basically had the idea that there are so many opinions, you can only gain ataraxia or inner peace by not having an opinion about anything. So he basically said that we should suspend our judgment, which is his famous phrase, suspend our judgment on anything. He didn't really argue any positive doctrine. All he argued, his whole school was based on the idea that we can't know anything for certain. And basically, Machiavelli says that these ideas in Fira could have been born from the Greek tradition because he says that he was taught by someone who was in the tradition of, of Democritus. And Democritus, um, for those who don't know, was an atomist, he propounded theory of atomism, and he was also a sceptic on many things too. There are also other sceptics such as, for example, Democritus, Plato, of course, with his theory of forms and sense experience, and Parmenides, etc. But then there are other scholars who agree that Fira was influenced by Buddhism. 
One of them is Richard Stoneman in his book, The Grief Experience of India. Um, Derek has, you have recommended that on your page before. Um, I really recommend it. It's probably the best book on Alexander Lonely India I've ever read. It's a brilliant book. But I really recommend that. And he said he believes that Pira was influenced. He basically says that he believes that Vira adopted Buddhist attitudes to kind of life and some Buddhist doctrines, maybe influenced by some Buddhist doctrines. And he definitely agrees that there was an influence. I take a middle of the road approach. I do believe he was that Vera was influenced by Buddhism. He was in India Central Asia for two years. There was a guy called Richard Beck. He kind of has the opinion that, oh yeah, there couldn't have been any influence at all because it's not enough time for him to have learned complex philosophical ideas in a language that he wasn't fluently speaking, like that he wasn't native to. I disagree with that. So do Stoneman and Kamansky very much disagree with that. They, you know, he would have been surrounded by speakers of Indian languages for two years more than enough time in my opinion to learn the language or even for an Indian person to learn Greek Alexander must have had people who could speak local languages in his entourage we know that an Indian philosopher called Calamus went with Alexander from India and kind of stayed with him for a bit I do agree there was definitely some kind of influence on Fira that he did adopt some Buddhist attitudes to life for example Stoneman says that he might have been reciting mantras he was said to give a kind of lecture and people weren't even there he was said to mumble to himself, sort of like an Indian mantra. Also, though, do you think that he could have learned his, some of his sceptical attitudes in the Greek tradition? Because obviously he would have been in India, but he wouldn't have stopped being Greek. He couldn't have stripped himself of his Greekness and got rid of it, put it to one side. And there was, as I've mentioned, a tradition of scepticism and suspending judgment. After their conquest of the Punjab and surrounding areas, the Indo-Greek kings occupied Gandhara and almost certainly had some dealings with the local Buddhist communities. In your opinion, do you believe that there were any instances of Greek thought being received in a Buddhist medium? How much credit should we place in the notion that there was any cross-cultural transmission of ideas, whether Greek to Buddhist or Buddhist to Greek, or can we see a convergence of ideas independent of one another? As I've kind of already alluded to, there was a big cross-cultural transmission between Indian and Greek culture. There is a really good Indiologist called Johannes Bronckhurst. He believes that the Indians are influenced by Greek ideas like atomism, which became the Dharmas in a Buddhist school of philosophy known as Abhidharma. And also he thinks that the Greek tradition of good debate inspired Buddhists to make their system, which was a bit haphazard, into a coherent whole so they could defend it from the Greeks in philosophical debate. I do agree with him in the fact that I do think that they would have seen that the Greeks, okay, these guys, are, they have their own beliefs, they defend them really well, we need to defend ours to have a good chance of, of showing that ours are obviously better. don't really agree that all of the argumentation in Buddhist philosophy came from Greek influence because there was a big tradition of debate and argumentation in India, even before Buddhism already. In the Upanishads, for example, there's a big tradition of debate and debates of different views. And Machiavelli, to mention him, says that Indian philosopher called Nagarjuna, and Nagarjuna was the founder of a school of Mahayana Buddhist philosophy called Madhyamika, and he is an extremely, extremely important Buddhist philosopher, to the extent that he's called by Buddhists the second Buddha, he's that important, like second only to the Buddha himself. So without going into the massive complexities of Madhyamika philosophy, the central idea is that everything is empty, that nothing has its own self-existence. Now, Keep that in mind. We'll come on to that in a minute. So uh, Machiavelli said that he kind of agrees with Bronckhurst and he kind of says that he thinks that Nagarjuna in his text that we have of him was very good at dialectical argument and argumentation. He thinks that this form of argumentation appeared only with Nagarjuna. And a lot of scholars have said, oh yeah, this proves how brilliant he was. You know, he, he developed this on his own. So he basically says that he thinks that the fact it's so sudden, this dialectical argumentation in India, alludes to the fact that it was outside influence and he basically says that he thinks that Greek texts on argumentation from the dialectic through trade and you know I guess immigrants from Greece and Macedonia carrying over to India influenced Nagarjuna. He developed that form of argumentation from Greek influence because he says that it took ages to develop, like centuries to develop from Parmenides to Socrates so why would it have developed like so suddenly in India? Like the tradition from Nagarjuna can't really be traced back whereas from Greece obviously you can from Parmenides to Socrates like I just said I do agree slightly. I think that's entirely possible. It could have happened. But I do think there was a tradition in India already for Nagarjuna to draw upon from the from Greece. And he was a bit later than our period. He was the Roman period in, in Europe. Apart from that, there was also the Melinda Panha. That was basically a text 
from the recorded conversation between Melin- uh, Melinda the First, who was the Indo Greek king, and a Buddhist monk called Nagasena. Many people have said that this is, takes the form of like a pl- platonic dialogue, it might have been influenced from that. We know that there was a philosophical essay thing, you know, about Plato's forms discovered in Afghanistan. So we know that there was philosophy going on in these parts. Melinda Panha reports a conversation between these, this Buddhist monk and this indo Greek king, the Buddhist Saint Nagasena, and he basically, the story says, you know, he converted the king to Buddhism. We know more or less from independent historical sources that Minanda was a Buddhist king. He was a patron of Buddhism. According to sources, his relics were treated with reverence, like the Buddha, after his death. More or less, definitely did convert to Buddhism, I think, anyway. Basically, the whole text is just Nagasena explaining Buddhist philosophy and Buddhist doctrine. There's a lot I could go into in that. But the main ideas I do want to come back to is the idea, what I said with Nagarjuna earlier, about nothing having, having its own self-existence. So in Buddhism, apart from saying that the goal is to end suffering, the Buddha also thought that there were these three other things that permeate our lives, called the three marks of existence, which is also incidentally some of the things that scholars say are similar in Fyro's philosophy too. And they were sufferings, or dukkha, impermanence, which is anika, and the doctrine of no self, which in Pali is anatta and Sanskrit is anatma. So this is a very important and unique, should I, I should add, doctrine in Buddhism. And it's essentially the idea that nothing has a permanent self or permanent soul or permanent inherent existence. So imagine you have a chariot, a modern um, equivalent could be a car. Imagine there's a car and the car, a car or a chariot made up of different parts. You've got the axle, the wheels, the engine, the doors, the hat door handle, the roof, all these parts. And all these parts together make up a car. But which part is the car? Like I said, asked obviously with the chariot to the king. And the king's obviously like, what, what is this guy talking about? And the idea is basically that the car or the chariot doesn't exist except when these parts are put together. So there is nothing that on its own can be called the car or the chariot. Because without these parts being put together, there is no car or chariot. So in the same way, Buddhism teaches that we, we don't have an inherent soul or self. What we think of as, a, as our soul or self is made up of various interdependent things called kanandas or skanandas in Pali and Sanskrit. That are things like our perception, our ideas and intentions, our bodies and things such as that. And all of these things are in constant flux and always changing. Our bodies have changed when we, when we were born to now, of course. That's just a simple fact, right? So all these things are in constant flux. Our ideas, etc., do as well. You won't think you won't think the same ideas from when you were twelve to now. So because all these things are in constant flux, there isn't really anything in us that stays the same. Ourselves and what we think of as ourselves are in constant flux and constantly changing. And that is one of the main things the Buddha taught. That's one, like I said, tells to Menenda. And that essentially was one of the main things that inspired Nagarjuna. Because Nagarjuna actually said that nothing has any self-existence because everything is dependent on something else to exist. He basically expanded the uh, Anatta viewpoint. And he said that because everything's dependent on, on everything else, like nothing exists on its own. So everything exists with everything else. And therefore, everything is empty in Sanskrit, shunyata, of inherent existence. And this is a very important doctrine in Buddhism. It also caused a lot of controversy. A lot of other, even other Buddhists said it was nihilistic. He was saying nothing existed. And he didn't, he got, no, no, he didn't want to say nothing existed at all. He was saying nothing existed without his dependence on something else. So that is one of the main ideas that Nagasena gives to Melinda. It's also unique to Buddhism, as I mentioned earlier, because no other religion has anything like this, even in India. In India, the main religions at the moment are obviously um, not excluding Islam, obviously Hinduism, Jainism, and Sikhism. All the, these three religions I just mentioned believe in a permanent soul. All of them believe in a permanent soul that reincarnates from life to life. And it's the same person, the same thing that reincarnates from life to life. Buddhism is the only one that does not. It obviously convinced Menenda because he converted to Buddhism and said, yeah, yeah, you basically beat me. So that in itself is a evidence of influence. There was also a, a piece of a vase found in Swat, which is now part of Pakistan that had an inscription on it by a man named Theodorus, again a Greek name. And basically it's an inscription saying that he has dedicated the relics of Lord Shakyamuni. Shakyamuni is a name for the Buddha, basically it means sage of the Shakya, which is the Buddha's clan, Shakyamuni, which means sage. So sage of the Shakya, that is what they called the Buddha. And then he says, dedicated these relics, and he left them in this stupa, which is where the piece of the Mars are found. Now Theodorus is a Buddhist name. You could probably say he converted to Buddhism, 
we know that Buddhists did this. To go back to Ashoka, I said I'll come back to him. His inscriptions were in Indian languages. They were also in very good Greek. The Greek community in India could not have been small because he would have seen, no, why would he bother putting the inscription in Greek if there was not many people there who could read it? So it must have been very big. And also, we know that there were Greek Buddhist missionaries that he sent to Greek areas. So there was definite big cross-cultural influence there. We do know that there was a call by the Christian philosopher Clement of Alexandria. He writes in one of his books, the Indians worship a being called Buddha, or Buddha, as he puts it in Greek, who is, who is worshipped as a god due to his extraordinary sanctity. Now, that is very cool. And that shows that the name and the figure of the Buddha had spread from the Indo-Greek cultural areas back to the Greek east of the Roman Empire. So Greeks in the Roman Empire later on, and I'm guessing Greeks, maybe even in Greece in the Hellenistic period, who knows, definitely knew about the Buddha, maybe even Buddhist teachings. The annoying thing is, just to come into a conclusion on this question, is that history is very annoying because so many things people didn't write down. So how many conversations do you think might have sort of played between a Greek immigrant, for example, and a Buddhist monk? All these things that could have happened, but because we don't have any written evidence for them, we can't say they did. It's kind of obvious that they must have. So, yeah, there was very big cultural and intellectual influence as a result of Alexander's conquest from Greek to India and from India to Greece back and forth. I think a real mixed culture developed. And to kind of finish, I think it's really important that things like this are known about, which is partly why I agreed to do this podcast, because so many people, especially nowadays, have the idea that cultures have been in this li these little isolated kind of cultural blocks just with each other until recently where multiculturalism blew up and everybody started talking to each other. And it's complete nonsense. It really is nonsense. Multiculturalism has existed since the dawn of time. And the Hellenistic period for me is one of the most important eras of multiculturalism. And I think the fact that there were Easterners, e e Easterners and Westerners in brackets, mixing, intermarrying, interacting, influencing each other is very, very cool. And I think if we realise that things like that have always happened, it will help us to get along more in the present and to come to more cultural harmony, religious harmony in the present. I realise that this stuff's always happened and we need to try and get along with each other and learn from each other as best we can. And on that note, I believe this is an excellent place to end our discussion. And I'd just like to say thank you once again for taking the time to talk about the confluence of Hellenism and Buddhism. It's a very exciting topic for me, and it's something that I'd like to hear more about. Before we conclude the episode, are you currently working on any future projects, or is there anything you'd like to plug or share for my listeners? The main project that be relevant to this and for listeners is an article rather I've written is being published in an academic philosophy magazine in the UK called The Philosopher 1923. It's about essentially three Buddhist schools of philosophy, two of which I've mentioned here, including Nagarjunas. And it's basically why we should study Eastern philosophy, because Eastern philosophy is overlooked a lot, in my opinion. And I'm trying to say it's just, it's just as good as Western philosophy and we should study it too. That is being published. So if, if any listeners were any interested in Buddhist philosophy, anything I said, they'd like to know a bit more about Buddhist philosophy, different ways that Buddhists saw the world and thought, that article would be good to read. If anyone wants to follow me on Twitter, my Twitter is at one and only Lee 5 I will publish it on there. So if any listeners are interested, they can find my stuff on my Twitter. So yeah, that, that is really it, essentially. Fantastic to hear, and I will always make sure to include any links in the podcast description and in my show notes on the website as per my usual form. But in the meanwhile, thank you all for joining us today, and you've been listening to the Hellenistic Age Podcast. <laughs>